what does this reading films mean? There is one question that would you know, come up throughout the presentation. What I'm trying to do is basically look at uh, the idea of uh, cinema and reading cinema, analyzing cinema, and present some uh, basic uh, notions about appreciation film, appreciation film analysis, after which maybe we can you know, expand it, we can go into specific areas through question answer sessions uh, following this presentation. So I will start with a very, uh, very interesting quote by a filmmaker. He said, these film viewers, you know, they come from different backgrounds. Like he may be a butcher, he or she, may be a butcher, a banger, or grocer by profession. But when it comes to films, everyone is a film critic. Because everybody has an opinion on films. Because it is such a kind of, you know, uh, very easy to understand sort of thing. There is another you know, uh, a filmmaker like Truffaut saying, it's so easy to understand that it's very difficult to explain. It's so easy, it's very, it's very evident. You see it, you watch it, you, you know it. So what is there to talk about it? There is, this is one question which has been asked in the early periods of film criticism actually. What do you want to talk about? This? You know, it's, it's, it's a kind of, it has always been a global art. It has always been a mass art. So it doesn't need any kind of initiation. You don't have to be literate. Like if you want to uh, watch and appreciate a classical art form like Kadagali or opera, or whatever. Like you need some sort of understanding about its, its content, its the, 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 the technicalities of its presentation, aesthetics. For instance, you have you know uh, different uh, elements of aesthetic appreciation like Vajiga, Ahaira, Abhinaya, a lot of things which you have to know beforehand to actually enter into that narrative world, into the enter into that to appreciate that. Uh, uh, the whatever that art form is trying to present. Secondly, uh, it is also like if you look at art forms prior to cinema, they were either needed, for instance, literature, you need to be literate to understand it. And also other kinds of art forms were either uh, classical and needed some sort of initiation to understand it, or they were actually local or regional or caste specific, community specific, etc. Like cinema was the first art form which actually broke all these barriers. I would say the silent cinema period, right, from 1895 to 1925, 26, was the only period in which the whole of humanity had a single art form. Because you have, for instance, you have somebody like uh, Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton or Eisenstein or Kudokin or, you know, uh, Carl Dreyer. All those films were watched across the world. You didn't need any kind of, you know, initiation to do it. You just watch it and appreciate it. So you had a global art form where all the people all over the world actually appreciate the single art form. And secondly, you should also note the fact that cinema actually traveled very fast. Unlike other art forms, cinema within the first decade of its invention, so-called invention in 1895, which is actually the invention of a particular mode of showing and watching. Note that films not, were not screened earlier or moving images were not invented earlier. But I think the, the format in which we, it became popular, like you pay for, you go to a theater or a particular screening space, you pay for it, you sit and watch images on the screen, was invented in 1895. And if you look at the first decade, within the first uh, one and a half decades, cinema had reached all the continents in the world. Secondly, unlike other art forms, cinema was a kind of art form which not only went to many places, it also brought back images because early, early films, you know, the, 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 the equipment that is used to project films was also the equipment with which you can shoot images. So what happened was cinema went all around the world and also brought back images into global circulation. So it, it triggered kind of global circulation of images and, you know, it, it, it was appreciated, welcomed, embraced by all the people in the world. So that is one thing that is unique about cinema. But, so what I'm trying to say is, it's, it's globality is something that we need to keep in mind when we appreciate cinema. It's, it's global in kind. And so I, as I can say, it, all, it always went, you know, the kind of infrastructure it needed, the kind of audience it looked for, and you know, it created, not only looked for audience, it also created an audience, was basically urban because it needed a certain kind of you know, infrastructure to show it, a certain kind of people to come together to watch it. 
so it was also kind of you know it it went to urban centers to 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 where you know market centers and all that so it had a kind of you know it traveled all across uh, uh, urban spaces across the world uh, and also third thing is like uh, as i said it was it 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 uh, it triggered a circulation of global images it brought back images and it also created a language of you know visual language that could be understood by all so it is a kind of mass art in that sense so it, so if you look at if whenever you when you talk about cinema when you, you whenever you analyze cinema when you talk about film culture you know you have to keep this in mind its globality its you know uh, uh, the way in which it began as a mass art uh, thirdly you could also say uh, it is hybrid in nature it if you look at the history of cinema it has always been able to imbibe to incorporate to adapt to other mediums of art like for instance cinema itself is hybrid art because it has it has you know all the other art forms blended into it, forms part of it it is literature it is a huge and long love hate relationship with literature from the beginning till now so it has a kind of very strong uh, relationship with literature it has theater in it it has all kinds of performance aspects in it it has architecture in it it has painting in it it has music in it so it encompasses all kinds of you know uh, art forms it's a hybrid kind of art form secondly even the post cinema uh, you know media forms like television or internet or all kinds of multimedia digital possibilities of uh, imaging whatever you can imagine that is what digital makes possible you can ima image whatever you can imagine all those you know, developments that happened after the invention of cinema became part of cinema so one thing is about cinema is as you said is a mass art is a global art it is a hybrid form which can incorporate which has consistently incorporated other art forms into its narratives into its you know uh, in its technology uh, of making of exhibiting of sharing fourthly one could also talk about uh, which is one point which i would like to emphasize is its publicness basically i would look at cinema as is one of the major uh, on the most significant uh, feature of cinema as we understand it as i as i would like to you know define it is a kind of experience which we have uh, now it is actually becoming a, a very uh, special or in a very sideline kind of space marginal kind of space where because if you if you look at the kind of present pattern of, of viewership of cinema you can see that those who watch film in a theater in a big not on the big screen are minuscule actually people watch it on mobiles tabs pcs or whatever like you have a lot of handheld formats you have sort of small screens on which you watch these films but actually originally film is meant to be watched on the big screen and it is a kind of specific kind of experience because it happens in the public so the publicness is something that is uh, very crucial to cinema very significant to cinema and also the reason why it doesn't die actually i would say this publicness is what makes uh, sustains or maintains the magic of cinema you enter a dark space particular at a particular point in time this the scene darkens you a light is projected on the screen you watch a huge images of people and of landscapes of whatever and you are sitting alone but you have a lot of people you are alone but together you are sitting in the dark it's a kind of voyeuristic kind of you know view at the world you are entering a narrative world so this kind of experience has a kind of you know magic to it which is which cannot be replaced by any other uh, you know form of viewing for instance on television or uh, you know so called fourth screen that we are living in now from cinema to television to computer to mobile screens so all these all the others doesn't offer this magic of publicness of sitting in the dark watching huge images sitting alone but together that sort of magic is what is central to cinema so if you look at so all these aspects are very very central to cinema and i think that is what makes uh, cinema uh, the, the looking at talking about cinema a, a a different kind of enterprise i would say very exciting kind of enterprise so again 
coming to the the process of watching films we all watch films everybody is watching films so and we are affected by it in different ways for instance uh, maybe people are fascinated uh, carried away by the story some people are attracted by the theme of that film uh, or the way in which it is presented maybe we admire uh, or adore the actor or actresses in it maybe we like some we, we, actually we had this kind of you know uh, if maybe it is kind of alien kind of thing a very uh, strange uh, kind of uh, thing for a contemporary audience but earlier when we used to watch films people used to say there is good scenery in the film people used to say because film was one way of looking at the world traveling around the world so you say landscapes you know, that you see different kinds of landscapes which itself was the 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 part of the magic of cinema of go, the point of going to movies and you know uh, maybe people watch the scenery the landscape visual compositions some may be enjoying the dialogues you know, the kind of you know dialogues and you know the jokes or songs or dances or stunts even violent scenes people enjoy go to watch horror films people go to watch you know very violent kind of movies so all these give certain kinds of scopophilic pleasure to the door so actually is a kind of very sen- very complex kind of visual experience that we are talking about when you talk about cinema that cannot be reduced into any one of these elements it is not just the story is not just the theme not just actors writers and stars not just about in its politics it's not just about these single elements but it is a kind of composite visual experience that is why we call cinema sensorium actually it's a kind of you know it's not just about Uh, uh you know meanings it's not just about uh, stories it's not about themes it's a kind of it's a kind of comprehensive sensorium that cinema offers us every time so actually each one of us who are watching these films you don't know what they're watching you, you are watching a different film each person is watching different film just like uh, any other art form because it's a kind of complex interface between the film images or the film narrative the film and the viewer you have you know uh, for instance like somebody like bertol brecht the the famous uh, renowned uh, german uh, poet and playwright he said the audience who come to watch my plays are not just sitting in the theater they are also sitting in the world they have not actually you know taken off their all their life all the experiences all the biases all this hatred all the love all their political beliefs all their religious you know uh, beliefs all that they're not sharing it they're not put, uh, keeping it outside the theater and coming in naked to as a clean slate in front of the image they have their own biases they have their own opinions they have their own you know anxieties their own expectations dreams fears all these they carry and it is this interface between a complex human being a complex audience and a very complex narrative world that creates that constitutes the aspect of you know cinematic cinematic experience for us so it's a very kind of complex kind of interface that you are talking about so it has actually so you have you have it has social political cultural and undertones as well as personal psychological you know aspects to it its appreciation brings all these into play so when we see movies so we are entering an audio visual field and also a narrative world so that, that is what we would like just briefly talk about for a few minutes now like we are entering an audio visual field we are also entering a narrative world uh for instance if i would like to actually you know just briefly go into uh, a few haiku poems poems like uh which has been which Eisenstein says, if a filmmaker like Sergei Eisenstein, who was one of the uh, major filmmakers who made Battleship Potemkin, Ivan the Terrible, Way We Were Mexico, and all these, considered one of the greatest filmmakers ever, uh, he actually, you know, was a kind of he created the theory of montage. He developed it uh, during the revolutionary period in Russia in the 1910s and 20s, and he actually used. how uh, how does images how does image images make meaning how how does it convey meaning so he thinks that according to him what it it, it conveys meanings by bringing in disparate aspects different kinds of elements are brought together to create 
a particular kind of effect or meaning or significance significance in your mind so what he is saying is these elements whatever the 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 image or a poetry is trying to talk about is not in that in those elements the, the meaning doesn't rest there but it happens in your mind so for instance you, let us look at some of these uh, poems by haikus haiku you know is a japanese words form poetry form using a few words like 10 uh, 14 words to create a meaning usually three lines you know you have, you have three lines for instance i will read some out read out some of the basho poems he lived in the 17th century autumn evening a crow has settled on a withered branch autumn evening a crow has settled on a withered branch another a frog jumps in a frog jumps in and the water sounds an old pond another one chopping a tree then looking upon the cut end tonight's moon another one on the blue sea on a blue sea waves fragrant with rice wine tonight's moon again the oars sound striking the waves a bowl freezing night and tears so look at these poems actually all these poems these are you can say three sets of images three or four images coming together there is a kind of and through these images you know frog jumps water sounds old pond if you look at his three images what eisenstein is trying to say is that there is nothing in those images so frog is a frog a pond is a pond a frog a jump is a jump there is a sound but when they come together very disparate kind of elements they create a certain kind of meaning in meaning in in the audience in the reader in the viewer in the listener it creates a kind of meaning so what he says is that the meaning doesn't rest there but it is created in you and is created by disparate elements coming together conflict of you know he, he says you have this this is antithesis and synthesis an image another image follows a particular image and a third image is created in your mind so it doesn't have anything to do with the images themselves but what is happening within you that is the point he was trying to say and he takes these haiku poems as a kind of uh, 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 <clears throat> as examples where this happens where you have a particular kind of in you know, a very simple kind of you know images events happening which is described very you know uh, 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 dispassionately objectively but it evokes a, a, a very deep kind of you know uh, thoughts images affects in you that's what he's trying to say so he says cinema also works along the same lines here it creates it puts together different kinds of images which creates which are conflicting between themselves and it creates meanings inside that is what he's trying to say so what so if you come back to the, the, the technology of cinema, what is actually, uh, what is cinema? Cinema is actually about, you know, uh, movement of frames. So you have 24 frames per second, classical cinema, not the digital one. It's, it's it maybe it's changing, uh, uh, you know, the idea of the frame is changing. But still, you have this idea about 24 frames, you know, moving, you know, in a second. That is a... Uh, the accepted, you know, the, the, the uh, speed of uh, film screening or projection. So what happens is like you have, uh, there is no movement in each of these images. Right? If you look at the film strip, you can see 24 still frames, still images. But when they move in a particular speed, there is an illusion of movement being created in you. As you all know, it is about, uh, it's all about persistence of vision. The kind of deficiency or you know characteristic of our eye which creates movement so there is no movement there is only illusion of movement there is only experience of movement which happens not in the film but in us in our you know mind screen it happens the movement likewise the meaning of cinema is also not in that frame you know you that's why i said uh, where brett says the film viewer or the theater uh, the person who comes to a theater also comes hit 
its own baggage of life sufferings hopes dreams so he also actually he he creates meanings out of this experience whatever he is watching he the meaning is created in him so just like the, the very technical aspect of movement illusion of movement that cinema is based upon the meaning of cin cinematic images is also not in the frame in the images but is created in the viewer so basically film you can see film is an an audio visual and textual art so the reading of films so uh, you you have to actually look at all these elements the various kinds of elements that uh, form part of its you know all these visual elements we are talking about so it could be like you know uh, uh, how are these film narratives created narratives about uh, stories about people in certain locations which presents different ideas which is presented in a particular aesthetic manner that is what you call a narrative film so there is if you look at if you look at it closely like you will have to go into different elements of cinema hence like this idea about uh, the frame the shots the sequence which often people uh, uh, you know uh, connect with uh, the kind of words sentences paragraphs passages and all that same way cinema is put together you have different kinds of uh, shots being put together to create particular kind of narrative so it is a kind of a huge kind of you know uh, uh, revolution in cinema when people when filmmakers or you know early magicians of cinema actually put invented this art of putting shots together to create the narrative so if you look at the the history of uh, film theorizing theory about film like you can see that there is this whole idea about you know the idea of the shot and how they can be put together and how you know meanings are created longer narratives are being told through putting together of shots so you have i want to say to put it in a very simple way you, you have uh, you maybe you can look at it as two elements it's going to time and space you have the element of time you have the element of space and cinema is actually playing with both like it the manipulates time it plays with space it spatializes time it temporalizes space that is how it works so you have basically i will just you know for those who are very conversant with film terms i will just you know briefly Uh, uh, you know, explain these two terms. It's the montage is actually is a French term which means putting together. You put things together. You, you join shots together. Editing is montage. So you just. So, but this process of putting together of shots in cinema is actually is, uh, is has something to do with time. Because it is through this process of putting shots together that. cinema manipulate or uses or create cinematic time in the sense it can actually extend time it can show something that happened in 1 minute in 5 minutes or 10 minutes or 1 and 1/2 hours or it can actually show something that happened in 100 years in 10 minutes so it can compress time it can expand time it can also freeze time your freeze frames you can freeze time so it actually through this process of montage it can actually play with time can manipulate time can compress expand freeze time so it creates a different kind of time sense a cinematic time uh, uh, that every viewer gets into in the process of watching cinema so for instance you have you know you, you can see many of the early films actually playing with this time element because you can see if you look at a falke film oh it's one of the most famous and popular film was this growth of a plant he kept this camera for a long time from uh, in the seed from seed state to it becoming a growing up shooting up to becoming a plant so uh, when it's shown in one minute uh, scene like it actually the the, the speed the, the seed breaks the sprout comes up it, it it grows it pushes up and becomes you know leaves this is a huge thing about it so it is actually what is happening is there is a kind of specialization of time is actually a process of time being specialized and you can see in many films you can somebody is shooting you can see these rajini films all these matrix and all that where you have a bullet being shot and it it you can see this very uh, you know slow motion uh, movement of this bullet passing you know because it takes split of a second for it to hit a target 
but you can see it moving through the screen. You know, time is expanded. So where you have a kind of temporalized sense of space, it's actually, you know, temporalizes space. So cinema has always been doing it, like to create a kind of cinematic space, it, you know, it, 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 is, it doesn't actually, uh, uh, you know, follow uh, the temporalities of so-called real life, but it creates a cinematic time of its own. It, it can compress time, it can expand time, it can freeze time, it can play with time. That is why uh, a filmmaker like Andrei Tarkovsky says, film is sculpting in time. It is, you're sculpting in time to create cinema. And also like, if you look at cinema, in film, you know, every shot is in the present time. You are present there, in, it happens in the present time. So our sense of time being, you know, direct and subjective, uh, is innate like other kinds of you know uh, knowledges through senses to objectify or measure time in concrete terms we can only do in terms of space you, you use a clock you use an hourglass you watch sun moon stars tide all these are actually spatial elements which mark time and you know it is what cinema also does it actually expresses different times by showing different parts of space so you can you know you can indicate uh, time through particular spatial compositions, maybe through shadows, through lighting, through different ways in which you indicate time through space. Because you only have space with you. And also one more thing would be like, you know, like cinema, because it's, though we would say cinema's language, there is no definite kind of language like, you know, for instance, literature. For instance, in literature, if you want to say uh, he's guilty, you have a particular notion about guilt and you can say he's guilty. But in cinema, if you want to show that somebody is guilty, you will have to specialize it. You will have to create a kind of language by which you show how he's feeling guilty. So if you have seen a film like, uh, for instance, a film like uh, Aravindan Chidambaram, I don't know how many you have seen it, but you should watch it. Like the film, there is one, uh, there is a, a protagonist falls in love with his, you know, subordinate's wife. Then the subordinate finds finds out, and he uh, commits suicide. They played by Srinivas, and the other is by Gobi, and his uh, wife is Smita Patil, and he commits suicide. And when uh, the the protagonist comes to know about him, he watches this body hanging from the roof. There is a, a brilliant long sequence of this Gobi running away. And it takes a few minutes, actually, it takes five, almost four or five minutes for that sequence to end. It, he goes through, runs through different terrains, and you know, he goes into certain rooms, he gets into nets. So it's a huge kind of sequence, which is actually, it is not saying anything, but it is actually trying to visualize the idea called the feeling like guilt. You feel guilty, you feel guilty, you, you want to run away. How do you express it? So what is special about cinema is that another filmmaker, this is not written in the text actually, it's not written in the story, though it is based on a story by C.V. Srinivasan, it's not written down there. But actually what Arundhan does is, he's trying to imagine a particular kind of sequence which will express the feeling of guilt of the character. So you have, a, you create a kind of sequence. Likewise, Another filmmaker dealing with the same story may be, may picturize guilt in a different way. So cinema doesn't have a, uh, have a definite kind of language like that of literature. It has to create a language every time, just to invent every time, unless a filmmaker is, you know, submits himself to stereotypes. Like you have uh, uh, different kinds of stereotypes at work, you know, which you usually use these quotes and stereotypes, which is, which what, what is unimaginative uh, filmmakers do, but imaginative filmmakers actually create a new kind of, you know, way in which you create, you convey meanings, you convey effects, etc. So that is what is important about uh, what is specific, uh, special about cinematic language. So another thing is like, if 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 uh, well, montage is all about time, it's all about compression, expansion, or freezing of time and playing with time creating tempos and rhythms of movement, 
creating a kind of cinematic time through, uh, you know, uh, connecting, joining together, linking of shots. Another aspect is about space. Uh, in space, cinema in space, uh, space in cinema is usually, you know, is has to do with mise-en-scene, which again is a French term of, which again means what is whatever is in the frame. Like you have, you know, if you want to show uh, a particular, you know, a character. What are the visual elements that are available to you? You have, you know, maybe we are talking about a kind of a fictional narrative. You maybe you have a human figures. You have some an object world that surrounds him. Thirdly, the kind of the background, whether it be interior or exterior. So all of these actually define the narrative world, even the mindset or the, the the mental condition of that character. So you have, for instance, we are going to show a, a, an agricultural laborer. He will, he, he will be sitting in a particular place. He'll be surrounded by certain kinds of objects and he'll be sitting in a particular kind of space. If you want to show a software engineer, it will be totally different. His body language, his you know, dress, the way he talks, the things that around him, the object world that envelops him and the kind of setting he's in, the interior, exterior, all these, so all these that form part of Byzantine are not you know, uh, accidental to cinema. These are all very deliberate kind of cinema. It's all, cinema is all about in the exclusion. When you create a frame like this, you are actually totally including, you're totally directing the view of the viewer to a particular thing. Because unlike theater, you just can't, you know, your eyes can't roll around, like you can't see the whole stage. You, your, your gaze, your look is directed. There is a close-up. You can only watch the whatever is shown by the camera. So camera is your eye through which you see the world. So unlike other art forms where the uh, spectator is immobile, here camera becomes a kind of fluid kind of. You can like the recent. If you look at the last ten years with the with the, imagine, with the, with the invention of this uh, jib te technology, really you just fly. The camera flies. It just which is unimaginable earlier. It can fly, it can you know, go anywhere it wants. So you have a kind of, the, the mobility of the eye has become so free and fluid that it has made possible a different kind of visual imagination. So that is uh, uh, what happens with that. So mise-en-scene is all about what is shown in the film. So what is shown in the film, what is included within a particular space are, as I said, could be human figures. So when you come to human figures, all the other elements of Aharya, of Vajika, how you talk, your body language, your the, the slang you speak could actually reveal where you come from. A slang could reveal your caste. A slang, the way you speak, could reveal your class position, your caste position, your region, your whatever. It can reveal a lot of things about your identity, your character. Second, the object world that is that surrounds you is part of the narrative. It creates a narrative world and is part of a kind of, you know, uh, narrative uh, atmosphere. Thirdly, the background, interior, exterior, again, signifies as a lot of, uh, you know, it's not just accidental, but it has a lot to do with what the filmmaker wants to convey. So all these elements are the mizen the, the kind of props, the kind of, you know, uh, the, 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 all the kinds of semiotic, um, elements that one can invest the uh, the character with, the objects with, the, the, the landscapes or the setting with, all these form part of the cinematic image. What is included within the frame, how you, you create a kind of particular kind of frame and what you intend to include it and, uh, and also the kind of way in which you look at it. So the whole question of camera angles, whether it's low, uh, top angle, whether it's low angle, it can indicate power where you're looking down upon somebody or you're looking up to something or somebody, whether it is a kind of very uh, uh, equal kind of people talking, uh, you have a different kind of setting, whether the camera moves towards someone, are you going to show a close up, a medium shot, a long shot, an extreme long shot matters, how the camera moves, tilts or pans or, you know, all these matters, like these are not just uh, uh, technical fads which the filmmaker uses, but has something to do with what he wants to say and how he wants you to see them. So that all these elements of mise-en-scene, camera movement, angles, 
uh, and the kind of uh, within the visual frame, not just about objects and elements, but lighting, the kind of moods that it can create, the kind of you know the the three the three grounds, uh, the the any any frame has. You have foreground, you have midground, you have background, and you can play with it. Actually, you can you can see many films where you can see certain foreground being uh, being brought into focus while the background becomes out of focus, or all we'll be using deep focus to show all the grounds, mid, back, and foreground in focus. All these you can play with. And these are not just playing with, but to create some kind of mood, to make a certain kind of you know, meaning, or to create a kind of emotional, sensual uh, impact upon the viewer. So visual scene is all about these things, how you play with space, how you actually you know, compose space, uh, and all that. And third element would be that of sound. Sound, again, with cinema being an audiovisual medium, sound plays a very important part. Like you have different kinds of sounds. Basically, I would just briefly say sound has two elements, diegetic and non diegetic. Diegetic, diegetic sound uh, means all those sound elements that form part of that narrative world, that is produced by the narrative world. For instance, someone walks. So you need the sound of walking, of footsteps. There is, you can see in the frame, you can see a fan running. So you need, you know, the sound of the fan. Uh, whatever elements I speak, somebody, you can see somebody speaking. So you need, you, you feel uneasy or, you know, uh, disturbed when there is, that sound is not in the frame. So you, don't, you can't hear the sound. So all these are di diegetic sounds connected, linked to whatever is happening to the, happening in the narrative. Second, there, is, there can be non-diegetic sounds. Diegetic sounds can also be off-screen. Like, for instance, if you want to create a feeling that the character is sitting in a very busy kind of place, you can maybe you have you can have street sounds, vehicle sounds. Uh, near there is a nearby uh, railway station. You can you can show these. You know, you can bring those motives, oral motives, into the film. For instance, if you look at a film like films of. Uh, Satyajit Ray, if you look at Pathar Panjali, Abhirajit, Abhu Sansa, so-called Abhu Trilogy of uh, uh, Satyajit Ray, you can see this element of train in all these films. As visuals, as, uh, you know, audio, you know, oral motives, like you have certain kind of motives he plays with the, 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 the train, because the sound of train, uh, you know, signifies or evokes the feeling of the, the end of the Village, the beginning of uh, you know modernity of you know a world outside of you know urban uh, Calcutta. It could you know of it could uh, signify you know arrivals and departures. It can have a lot of emotional uh, imaginations that it can evoke. So it uses those sounds. So sound is used as a kind of narrative element to 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 add to the narrative ambience of that film. So the narrative can be either diegetic, directly related to the narrative, or non-diegetic, where you use extra narrative sound, extra diegetic sounds, like maybe you have music to add to the kind of the emotional ambience of the uh, of the scene, or you may have you know voiceovers. All those things can be used, just for non-diegetic. Can be voiceovers, commentaries, uh, and music, background music. So if you look, so cinema, film, I think you will have to, uh, second, one more thing, like two things which I would like to add is like, one is we were talking about design scene where you are talking about different kinds of visual elements within the frame. So as I said, any kind of film is an act of inclusion where you frame a particular, you create a kind of frame to uh, make or direct the viewer to a particular, particular kind of visual. But it is, you can see, if you look at the history of film, you can see it's also a kind of uh, a method of exclusion. By including certain things, you're also excluding a lot of things. And a lot of studies, especially since the 70s and 80s, have been talking about this idea of exclusion. For instance, uh, the exclusion of women, exclusion of a whole lot of you know, people uh, from the narrative world, as if they don't exist. Uh, even if you look at Kinds of, you can see some kind of people, some kinds of landscapes, some kinds of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, livelihoods uh, being erased or never shown in cinema. They are made invisible by cinema. Again, you can also look at the way in which uh, an idea related to this is brought about by Richard Dyer, who wrote a book called White, 
where he says actually camera itself, the early camera, the film stock uh, had a major limitation in the sense that uh, it, it, it could not have, actually it can't uh, actually uh, show, capture a white skin together. For instance, if you have a kind of scene where you have a white and black character coming together, and if you light up the screen for the white man, then the black image, the black man would become a blotch of darkness. Or if you actually light it up for the, for the black figure to be, become visible, the white man would be a bleach. So what he's saying is, it's not just about uh, film or film technology or cameras, film stocks, all these technologies of seeing is not just about, you know, just technical matters. And their technology itself is racial. It doesn't allow white and black people to come together. It, it, you just can't create a narrative world where these can come together. And actually this, this the whole, you know, uh, film stock being developed, which is sensitive to both skin tones, happened much later in the 80s and 90s when, you know, uh, when actually furniture makers wanted to uh, advertise the various tones of wood in their advertisements. And they had to bring this lot of, you know, black and brown, uh, you know, color tones into with, uh, film stocks which are sensitive to these color stones. Then later, actually, when huge black stars emerged, like Oprah Winfrey and all that, they actually took the initiative to create uh, lenses and, you know, uh, digital cameras that can capture skin tones. So, uh, cinema, cinema has a long history of racial segregation, racialism. So, what is included is what we bring into analysis, but what is excluded, what is left out, what is erased, what is, you know, in, made invisible, is also very important to cinema. We have a few questions coming up. Amrita asks, um, film theaters were the first to be shut down with the outbreak of COVID. Enclosed and shared space is now viewed as germophobic. Do you think the response of people towards the enclosed nature of film theaters would change in post-pandemic scenario? Important question in the sense that it's not just about cinema. It's also about uh, any kind of space where people have to come together or people come together. It would be, you know, theaters, festivals, or public political protests. People can't come together. You just crowd. Social distancing becomes political distancing, and you know it can be used by the state. That is one a very very diabolic aspect of this uh, uh, this uh, pandemic, post-pandemic state of exception. As for theaters, actually, you know, uh, as I said earlier, like there is a lot of you know uh, panic in film industry about uh, you know film itself becoming you know redundant with OTT platforms becoming much more popular, people are going to shift to uh, new forms of viewing. That is one fear that is being expressed all over. But I think like, it is just like the fear of theater when film came or the fear of film when television came. So all these uh, uh, forms, art forms and media forms, like whether it be television or uh, theater or film, and the various channels through which it is shown. Like for instance, it's, we see it on mobile, we see it on tablet, we see it, we see it in home theaters, we see it in you know, upper theaters. All these are different forms of you know, engagement with the cinematic image. So I think uh, it is, it, 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 this is not going to actually uh, kill cinema. Cinema will survive, as I said, basically because of its publicness, the magic of publicness, it, none of the other forms are going to offer. Then we are watching in a home theater with all kinds of surround sound and whatever. That experience of watching together, the big screen on in the theater is something that is that that still is there. So I think post COVID maybe uh, it is going to a lot of, take a lot of time to for the theaters to again become functional. But it is going to come back. Secondly, if you look at the the the, the kind of you know narratives that OTT. Uh, offers and people enjoy and ratings and all that. Uh, you can see it is nothing to do with cinema, actually. If you look at, you know, for instance, the huge, uh, hugely successful uh, OTT serials, because it's all about serials, not just one film that OTT wants to show. OTT is much more, 
you know, is akin to television, where you have a kind of series where you go, you're watching it as binge viewing is what is promoted by OTT actually. You watch whether it be Father Lok or you know, Sacred Games or Money Haste or you know, all these big series. They are about, you know, they're not cinema actually. They're, if you look at the watch them closely, you can see that what is what makes them radically different from cinema is that they don't have this sense of duration. It doesn't stay. You just have to keep the viewers on the grid, on the hook, you know. And that is what counts. What happens and, you know, you're just following the drama. Not, you're not, it's not visual. It's actually about uh, drama. It's about the, the kind of very uh, gripping, uh, dramatic tales that we are very relevant, very politically, uh, you know, uh, uh, relevant kind of things that are happening, but they are not, they're not going to replace cinema because cinema is something else. That's the kind of visual field, the kind of, you know, the duration with which uh, film image works never works in OTT platforms. Secondly, another danger that I see is like, uh, if, you know, because OTT is almost taking over and, you know, uh, the problem with OTT is that it, the content of the of these platforms will be designed by algorithms. Algorithms on a global scale, not just regional or local, it's an, on a global scale. So global, what happens is certain kinds of tastes get repeated again and again. And you know, whatever experimentation which you hope for in terms of theme, in terms of presentation, in terms of the kind of narrative pace and rhythm that it, it is in tune with can never be done. Because algorithm always says, go for this. They will always go for this and create a kind of monotony of narratives of human emotions of the world, again, dangerously in tune with global capital interests and the market. Uh, well, that also bring about a kind of a democratization uh, in the sense of uh, uh, bridging the divide between parallel cinema and the commercial cinema because every cinema probably could turn to be like available in the same platform, quite unlike, like usually we have this conversation wherein we say parallel cinema can't get to the market, can't get to the uh, theaters because um, they are mostly experimentation and people may not take it like you see a Rajnikanth film or a, uh, a Amitabh Bachchan film or a Mohanlal film. So, uh, uh, so will that bring about something like that? Uh, is, is that a positive? It is, uh, uh, no, the what I see is like you have a space, like just like uh, even independent filmmakers can have their own OTT platforms in which you can you know, show your films. But the problem is like, uh, as a revenue model, it's a problem. Like how can you actually get across to people to watch it and, you know, and recover your money and create a kind of you know, uh, a global viewership to your film. There is a real challenge which has not been actually addressed unless a film is like you know, or Roma and all that, which is created by high profile directors getting high profile awards in huge festivals and coming to OTT platforms. I think that is just part of their brand equity, but is not, or if you look at the kind of the choice of films that they show, again, algorithm works. Because even art films, they find that certain kinds of films are, you know, uh, uh, promoted. For instance, if you look at the third world films that comes on OTT platforms, you can see that they follow a pa pattern. And that pattern, that taste, that preference is actually very political. It is very much Eurocentric, very much white centric kind of uh, thing. So I don't think, second thing is like, definitely, you know, a, a, a parallel cinema can have their own small platforms where they can share uh, in, uh, their uh, uh, work with the world at large. But one thing is they are not able to, the, the, the mainstream, the streaming of public taste created by these huge OTT streams of images, narratives are actually going to create uh, their spaces much more difficult right? because people get used to some kind of pace and they think this is the thing. This is what technical excellence is all about. This is what is visually contemporary is created by mainstream media, which makes uh, actually parallel filmmaking a very, very difficult, lonely, adventurous, suicidal endeavor. Okay. So uh, Navneeta asked, uh, can you explain how far Indian films are successful in portraying the contemporary realities to the common people? 
I would say like for if you look at uh, throughout, you, one thing about cinema is that you always had a serious art parallel cinema all over the world. They were not part of the mainstream. Uh, but always, all over the world, it has been part of the art house movie. So you, you, are, you don't have to be, you know, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, being a minority aesthetic. It's a minority cinema. Minority literature, it's a minority scene. That is its strength, and that is why it is able to question the, the, uh, the hegemonic modes of narration and imagery. If, but if you look at the last 20 post digital generation of filmmakers, they have been, they have actually brought uh, into the, 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 if you look at the, even the mainstream, very marginalized kind of. Narratives. For instance, you look at Marathi cinema, you look at the films in the Northeast, especially. Huge lot of films about totally invisible. They were totally invisible in the uh, larger national, you know, imagery, imaginary, and you know, visual space. Now they have come back uh, in a big way. Like even in Malayalam, if you look at the last, uh, I would say, last 20 years, last 10 years, uh, there were more parallel independent experimental movies than in the 70s. Though it is not celebrated about basically because of the fact that there are, there are no parallel critical discourses around it. There is no attempt to create parallel platforms to reach out to the people and to create a kind of, you know, an audience for it, which was happening in the 70s with uh, campus groups, film society movements, noon shows in mainstream theaters. There is a kind of you know, attempt to create a parallel space to watch this film, which is not happening now. Otherwise, it is doing well. I think it is, uh, Indian cinema is really doing well. Uh, not just when I talk about films, I'm not just talking about fiction films. And ta I'm also talking about documentary films, which are some of the, the best documentaries in the world are being made in India. All, about all kinds of issues. I think they have been the opposition in Indian polity, whether it be about environment, gender, human rights, Adivasis, minority. They have been, uh, you know, narrating these uh, unheard, unseen, worlds of experience. So Vidyasri is wondering if a good film critic uh, could become a better filmmaker. Never. <laughs> Not <laughs> that. Like it's probably different kinds of things actually. Well, film criticism is something else. Filmmaking, fabulation is something else actually, where you, are, you have this ability to actually think images and create images and narrate a story. That is it probably, I think, the, the the, the brain work, the kind of mind work that uh, goes behind is totally different from film criticism or writing about something is, that is already there. Maybe he has some brilliant ideas about how it could be, how it could have been, but he can't, he or she, it's, it's a different kind of you know, endeavors, I think. There are, there are a lot of filmmakers, film critics on the whole uh, new French New Wave movement. All of them were critics, like Godard, Truffaut, Roma, all of them were critics. They're all about film. And then they went into filmmaking, but they never wrote much after that. But still, that is possible, but two kinds of processes, actually. So I don't think that a, a, a good film critic or even a, 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 a film viewer has seen uh, millions of films can make a good film. But viewing is different, critiquing is different, making is different. Yeah. So uh, Santra is asking, how far? can we expand the potential of films by releasing them through OTT platforms as there is no censoring like the, like things. At the same time, how far these platforms can curb the possibility in a film? The films, as the film is concerned, there is censoring. You have to censor the film, actually. And, you know, even the OTT platform series are uh, no, not censored, actually. But even for them, for those series, like in the recent, even in Indian context, with some uh, tele series like Pada Lok and Sacred Games, really making very critical comments about the, the whole uh, political corruption in the country, they are bringing in, the state will uh, bring in a lot of restrictions into that. So that is uncensored kind of, you know, freedom is not happening in any platform. I don't think that all the platforms, like global media, Scene, global media industry, which I, by which I mean you know, newspapers, television, music, films, internet, all these together are actually owned by five companies. Mm -hmm. All of concentration of capital and you know the kind of control of content is unimaginably concentrated.
in the hands of few people and their interests are evident so i don't think that their interests are totally against or all for democracy and freedom of expression and against state so they go together they they actually you know negotiate between each other to to team control content so i no great hopes but always filmmakers and our technology itself makes possible a lot of ways in which to loop holes and you know ways in which you cut through you find other ways to get through so that can happen but not on this mainstream uh, platforms i think that answers preeti's question too now renu asks often the rise of entertainment industry especially cinema is said to have had an adverse effect on the economic advancement in india during the 20th century it is said to have increased the disparity by shifting the focus from agriculture to entertainment what is your take on it should i repeat i think uh, yeah no no the, the kind of you know the, the rise of uh, uh, i don't know how you link uh, the, the 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 various sectors in the economy like whether it be agriculture industry services and entertainment entertainment is supposed to form part of the tertiary sector uh, are linked together there is all over the world in the process of urbanization and globalization there is a move move towards you know from agriculture to industry and to knowledge industries and you know towards service sectors that is happening all over the world and nothing specific to india actually all over the world agriculture is you know becoming much more difficult for various reasons whether it be huge global reasons like uh, climatic change or for very local reasons like you know uh, the way in which uh, the issue the levels of pollution the way in which uh, the rivers are drying up uh, you know all those things like so the uh, agriculture is much more affected and you know uh, by all these factors rather than the expansion of you know i don't think i don't see the connection uh, like that okay uh, pratipa believes uh, films are not book based in india in any languages compared to hollywoods do we uh, fail to produce good literature material for film what is the future in this frame for literature and books eager for your views really as i said like cinema has always been you know uh, had a love hate relationship with literature all over the world you can look at, see any language any region any country you can see there was a kind of a long relationship which is still there like between this world and the image that is there like even if uh, hollywood has a long history of it because even now hollywood very major films are based on uh, books for two reasons one is that once a book is published you already have a kind of you know a assurity about assurance about its popularity you know? it's, it's it's something that has always struck a chord with the the market the reading market so what about the viewing market but if you look at the history of indian cinema you can see that this link is not broken though it has become much uh, you know if you look at malayalam cinema for instance you can see that from the 50s to until the mid 80s or up to the 90s uh, whole lot of films are based on literary works then there is a shift to uh, you know filmmakers themselves writing scripts uh, but still uh, uh, few very few uh, films are based on literature uh, maybe for the reason that uh, film making the kind of you know uh, literature that is happening around them are not exciting enough for the filmmakers to write or literature is becoming very very literary and you know film is becoming very very visual so that can also be the reason why it's not uh, maybe uh, not adapting uh, so much still it's there uh, and also it could also be if you look at hollywood more than adaptations i think uh, they are looking for uh, works which can become sequels like harry potter or you know so that a kind of you know uh, a very consistent uh, viewership or can be created through that you have a kind of a base created by writing upon which you build a kind of you know uh, visual uh, viewing viewership base but that has not happened in india maybe because of the kind of low economies of scale in which we were yeah uh-huh. anjali has come up with a difficult question 
uh, according to you which films are great or horrific examples of portrait of war trauma can you mention few names war yeah war trauma portrayal of war trauma uh, you want to both that... great examples and horrific <laughs> 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 i really think about it but still i think one the first film that comes to my mind would be night and fog by alan rene it is a documentary but i think it still you know it haunts you the images Holds you, and secondly, the the kind of you know uh, uh, the way in which war is made into a theme need not be actually war based. Can be about the 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 effects of war in the you know uh, that be, that is being portrayed in the narrative. Could be something like that. But if you look at the Indian scene, war war movies are very you know uh, rare. But uh, I think if you look at uh, a lot of you know films especially uh, what comes to anybody's mind immediately would be neo realist films like films of rossellini which is about war torn you know uh, italy then a lot of uh, films based on you know holocaust is something that has you know been uh, a huge uh, bank a treasure for hollywood they have been making films a lot of holocaust very interesting films are there uh i i bad films don't come to my mind actually you, know. <laughs> you can okay. think about it uh, pratibha says uh, sir popular or comedy genre has captured screen so vastly and so the experimental cinema is lacking behind like in past we had good women centered social uplifting theme cinema now such cinema is very unpopular and not earning money like thappad or any other what new themes should be worked on so maybe like you know uh, the thematic uh, choices like if you look at a, the thematic variety or bokeh of a particular film industry at a particular moment is actually decided by a lot of other factors it is not just about uh, the presence of some brilliant filmmakers or somebody making films like that but it's also about you know uh, viewership about the economy within which the visual economy eco within which a, a filmmaker is working uh, for the certain certain periods demand or create demand for some kinds of films for instance if you look at the films of 40s and 50s and 60s you have a particular kind of films coming up new musicals some kinds of films with nationalist themes because they are uh, they 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 actually strike a chord with the viewers because that is in the air so again uh, that is about if you take film as a particular industry particular entertainment mode second film also doesn't exist uh, in a vacuum actually it is existing within a kind of entertainment economy where there are other forms you have you know television you have now ott platforms coming up so you have other kinds of you know uh, entertainment forms of entertainment talking to people people vying for eyeball so what are the kinds of choices that you have for instance when television comes cinema has to be true like when television comes with very entertaining uh, uh sentimental melodramatic narratives it brings it home then cinema there is no point in cinema telling the same stories about man woman relationship about family feuds about all kinds of things if you look at if you films of the 90s when television post television malayalam cinema you can see suddenly cinema entering into a crisis because filmet 90s is also a period when a lot of filmmakers important filmmakers stopped filming like kg george stopped his film 90 uh, padmaraj and all of them act, uh, you know uh, uh, found it difficult in the post television era where many of the themes which they were uh, dealing with or many of the thematic terrains the film was rolling till then was taken over by television so cinema had to reconfigure itself it has created different kinds of narratives in other in other parts of the world if you look at europe and america you can see that film actually became big spectacular uh, and you know where the experience of watching a film cannot be substituted by watching it on television you just have to go to theaters you have this surround sound stereo effects huge screens or uh, 3d films all these films you know what they tried to do was to reconfigure film view film experience in a different way so that your viewership 
remains, you know, is, is still there. So they were creating different kinds of, but in India, what happened was like, you just can't, you didn't have economies of scale to, to make it like that. I would say like uh, post television, cinema became male and television became female. And you know, when you can't really create huge films, what you did was you create the huge heroes, all these macho, a superstar, valiant and kind of films came after 90s and television came up and took, captured uh, female viewers. Then cinema became male, it created, it, it, it magnified the heroes. It became huge. We never had uh, such heroes in the pre-90 period. You won't find, you know, these kinds of uh, macho, communal, uh, you know, heroes uh, where uh, if you look at, if you can just measure the kind of gender sensitivity of Indian cinema, Malayalam cinema by the, the, the age parity between the hero and the hero, actor playing the hero and the hero. That has actually come down, uh, you know, where you had to look at Nasir and Sheila or Satyan Sharma, they looked the same. They were full bodied, mature people, you know, playing uh, scenes. Like coming down in the 90s, 2000s, you can see that the age of the hero going up and the age of the heroine coming down. So that itself, you know, indicates that disparity the inequality of gender uh, this thing of uh, uh, cinema. Uh, yeah. Okay, that, I think that also answers uh, Pooja's question. She, she was wondering how far male gaze is there in Madhyalam cinema as there are only few female directors. So, yeah. Then um, John Lanjo had, uh, wants your suggestion with regard to books which compare Tarkovsky, Solaris, and Kubrick, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Yeah, there are a lot of studies, a lot of books on that, actually, because uh, there is a lot of versions about uh, of that same this thing. I think I can, I don't remember immediately, I can send it to the book. We have you know, uh, one or two books uh, dealing with that, Solaris and uh, these two versions of the same uh, story. Yeah. Um, Annie Maria Simon says, so, sir, with the coming of new generation cinemas in Malayalam movies, uh, we see the popularity of narratives happening only a few hours or a few days. The narrative time is comparatively reduced and the effect on audience is different from the conventional uh, Bildung's Roman conflict solving narratives spanning over a few months or years. And at the same time, we see audience seeking comfort in the series with long screen time. Both watching experiences are different and unique in their own way. What do you think is the reason people go, go for the former and the latter? Uh, I have written about it at length, but I will just summarize what I am uh, trying to do. Malayalam condition, at least. It is like there is in the, in the contemporary uh, all over India. Look at the new post 90s, especially after the, the millennium, 10 millennium cinema, there is a compression of. Uh, Computer of time in the sense that most of the uh, narratives are happening within a particular one day, a few days. Uh, there's a kind of immediacy, there's a kind of urgency to the whole narrative. Uh, there are a whole lot of films uh, in that genre, actually. Secondly, it is also, uh, I would, it, has, it has happened due to two reasons, I would say. In, in Maryland cinema, if you look at Maryland cinema context, you can see that uh, if you want to talk about it's also something to do with the, the, the passing away of the superstar times. Superstars needed, you know, they can work only in time because they need time. Because they, they, they need a past. They need a present to settle a lot of scores with the past. They need a future to drive and all that. But these new, uh, you know, uh, uh, narratives, which compresses time actually works with space. It expands space. If you look at all these films, they are about space. About Gucci or Casa Gold or all these. It, it works on space. It actually uh, takes away the male-centric hero figure and puts in a lot of other people into it. It's, it's the, the milieus are very familiar, ordinary. A lot of other people come into you know, play. And there is kind of democracy of you know, characters at work, which is absent in Malayalam you know, for the, at least two, almost a decade with the huge hegemonic presence of overwhelming presence of superstars, you had to actually create narratives and other characters in tune with this domineering presence. Now that is not there. So you have a kind of, you know, equality of characters and, you know, which 
is also an expansion of space. You have a lot of emphasis given on space, given to space. It happens in space because you have a, a, you have time is compressed. It expands in space. And again, uh, about this experience of watching series and cinema, there is a very a simple uh, way in which you can address it. Actually, uh, series doesn't have superstars. Cinema only cinema can create superstars. Because that, the kind of memory with which film works is totally different from series. Series, as I said, is actually a kind of, it is attuned to, it's a kind of addictive kind of thing, which, which invites you, almost forces you for binge viewing. You just get into that and you just can't stop yourself from watching it. So it's about stories, about dramatic moments, about conflicts, personal conflicts, uh, psychological you know, conflicts. It's about conflicts, resolution, uh, always keeping every... Uh, at the end of every episode at an edge. So you're eager to watch what is happening next. So there is a kind of huge, uh, very, very emotional, dramatic kind of uh, pace to it. It's totally different in cinema. Cinema doesn't work with that kind of space. It, it has a kind of different kind of pace. It works, as I said, with duration. It, 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 it lingers, it creates moods. See, it doesn't have moods, actually. It doesn't create moods. It is all about uh, dialogues and, you know, about what is ha happening uh, physically between people, between, you know, what happens there and all that. But cinema is not about what is happening. It's not, cinema is not just about stories at all. It's about mood, it's about a visual feel. It's a kind of, you know, atmosphere that a narrative visual world creates for you. It works with different kind of time sense, as I said, which is never, you know, uh, works in really series. So it won't have its own Merlin Mandro, which cinema will always have. So, uh, Dilna Raju is wondering um, how you see the championing for political correctness in cinema. Does this emphasize on political correctness after the originality of the characters created? Sorry, does this emphasis on political correctness affect the originality of the characters created? Well, maybe you are referring to the kind of you know uh, uh, anti-women statements that uh, often. Uh, forms part of our, you know, uh, film narratives, dialogues, and all that, which has been a uh, huge discussion in in uh, Kerala in the context of this emergence of WCC and all that. The uh, advocates of commercial cinema and those who uh, have, you know, uh, created such scenes, they say this is natural. This happens. So we are portraying reality which is, you know, uh, gender insensitive. So you have your hero speaking lines like that. So what is the harm in it? We are being realistic. Uh, being politically correct looks very stiff. Or, you know, it really makes sense in art. That is what uh, they But there is always this question of, you know, uh, does all these jokes and humor and satire have to be racial, have to be, uh, you know, uh, abusive of others? It doesn't need to be like it's a kind of choice that uh, the filmmaker makes, and also kind of you know uh, the 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 vision of uh, the filmmakers, and also their idea about the public, about the viewing public, that they like this. So the whole question is like, can you uh, 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 is art also about uh, interrogating existing notions about all this? So you create different kind of you question them you create different kinds of you know, uh, uh, man woman relationships that is what art should be doing not it need not be abusive to uh, be you know humorous or you know, to be entertaining to, to make people watch your films because you have seen a lot a lot of new generation films which have done it very easily like you know uh, uh, like kumblingi nights or you know dikshachi color all those all these films have been very. They have used satire. They have used all these, you know, uh, elements of skin color, of you know, minorities, uh, language, of the idea of hero, uh, heroine. All these they have subverted. They have created new, you know, they have given a new flavor to the whole idea of satire and you know, a man. -woman. So that is possible. Only people, unimaginative uh, people who are actually, you know, chauvinist different uh, such uh, statements. 
I think in this context, Mira asked, uh, uh, what do you subscribe to? Art mirrors life or life mirrors art? <laughs> uh, it doesn't like, you know, art has nothing to do with the real, actually. It's, it's another kind of reality, in a sense. And is, are you, do you think there is a kind of reality which is unmediated? You're actually looking at reality in a hugely mediated way. That is what I said. You are, my audience in the theater is not, they're not just sitting in the theater, they're also sitting in the world. You also have you know, notions about what is right, wrong, what is beautiful, what is ugly, who is hero, what is heroism, what is, you know, uh, the, the anatam, the macho thing to do. Everything you, you, you bring this baggage. You're looking at the world, you're experiencing so-called real through a lot of mediated ideas, mediated you know, images, imaginations, and your lot of narratives that you are yourself part of without yourself, you knowing it. So there is no question of mirroring that both are different kinds of fiction. Reality is a huge fiction that art creates for you. The Usha asks, uh, why do you think movies like Acts, Acts One and Hamid do well on digital platforms, but uh, will they even find a release in regular theaters? Off late movies based on Chaitan Bhagat's books or a film like Razi based on Calling Samet have been made. And there are stories uh, that are twisted to suit the Indian audience. Now, the, I think the, the, these films, oh, for instance, OTT, uh, you have to be careful about uh, uh, evaluating its uh, effectiveness or its reach uh, now. Is good because whatever is coming through OTT now were not made for OTT. They were made for theater releases, but because of this COVID situation, they were released through OTT platforms. So uh, they had to actually release it through this channel, but they would have liked to release it in theaters. And you don't know what kind of you know uh, response it would have had if it were released in theaters. So, uh, but as OTT platforms develop, there will be there is going to be a kind of you know uh, films that are made for OTT platforms, and that as I hinted earlier, is going to be not to be a kind of free choice for all. Where a lot of films are made and OTT is picking up good films, it will be a kind of uh, choice of films, the bouquet or the kind of content that will be available through these channels will be totally uh, you know ruled, determined, controlled by algorithms of viewership. So there is no question of moving away from the status quo in case of OTT because it is algorithm based uh, kind of, you know, tastes are defined. They go in a particular way, they move their wave, so form in a particular way and you know, pan out in a particular way. And all these have to line up for that. Even, you know, characters have to die, certain, you know, uh, series will have to end because of these algorithmic shifts. So it is not going to be, uh, it is going to be a different ball game actually. So when the moment you start making films for OTD, then you, you will find a new runner of films focusing on OTD audience. So it will be packaged like that because you have different audience. It's not the audience for cinema. Now, the audience for cinema, uh, you know, audience for cinema is totally different and it has to give a different kind of experience to keep its, you know, market intact or people will go to cinema to watch them. So it is, OTD is a new kind of challenge which will create new narratives and new new packaging, uh, whether it be its narratives or visual, or all kinds of you know, packaging is going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, Aishwarya says, uh, sir, could you please comment on the increasing normalization of violence, explicit rape scenes, a trend setting, uh, not so aesthetic, but explicit erotic visuals seen very dominant in the present celebrated series or dramas in the OTT platforms. I think like I am, uh, I'm not for censorship at all. I think it's, it should be a free kind of thing. People, it's, it's on the part of the viewer to be discerning, to, to see what you want. And always this, you know, you have this, who can watch what should be, you know, imbibed by us, well, what we should watch, what children should watch. Should, we should create a discerning kind of audience, you know, who knows which uh, uh, thing are best for us. And you have to make your choices in the brain, not to control the content. Because controlling content will only help uh, the state, the powerful people, not 
people like us because we need uh, free channels of expression different kinds of you know uh, 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 narratives and we should be able to choose like we can always shut down we can always not choose certain things you can always watch and critique but it should be there yeah. you know you just can't shut down uh, certain kinds of narratives as then it will extend to all these arguments about sexual explicitness will extend to political correctness then you will be seeing the same you know whatever the state wants you to see you'll be watching it till the end of the world so that is not uh, uh, well, alter ai navneeta uh, asked are gender disparities addressed in films what are the effective ways to deal with this problem where films can be a really good medium to reflect as well as deal with gender disparity you know like uh, all over the world like it has been a kind of you know uh, anti women anti minority in the so called hollywood or even films all over the world it has been so but if you look at the current scenario like the post me to scenario in the world that be uh, hollywood or other film industry so even hindi cinema you can see there is a huge shift happening there is a huge you know jolt given to the the patriarchal uh, mindset uh, that you just can't do certain things it has been totally unjust and you know women have not been side not only in front of the camera they have also always been you know abused and you know uh, marginalized in all uh, um, you know aspects of cinema of making of film viewing whatever now it is i think it is beginning to change in a big way a lot of filmmakers uh, uh, films are dealing with these issues because many if you look at many of the series it is explicitly about gender disparities uh, if you look at a whole, whole lot of you know films uh, series even they are actually talking about a lot of uh, aspects of indian polity uh, which have now been narrated so far so things are coming out and i think these new platforms are helping you helping uh, that those kinds of expressions to uh, to to surface and also uh, the kind of the the energy that me to movement have given to or uh, many organizers like wcc is going to actually create a kind of you know even may they, they may not be successful in that sense but it is send a clear message to the industry to the male uh, actors and technicians and filmmakers that this is unjust this is you know uh, not the way to do things so that is a kind of you know situation that they have create will have a positive impact on a uh, cinema of the future right? that uh, they may have failed to become a huge presence but they have made an impact they have sent a message across to people and to the film uh, industry that is very very important i think all kinds of uh, you know unfreedoms are addressed like this it takes a long time i think that is a very positive kind of thing that has happened in the recent times so uh, antira as Sir, as a critic, can you say how far or near is Indian cinema from winning Oscar? Actually, Indian cinema should not be looking at Oscar at all. Like Oscar, if you look at Oscar, actually there is a lot of misconceptions about Oscar. Oscar is not a a, a kind of award which uh, is given to the best film in the world. It is not. It is actually you know it has a lot of you know rules uh, for a film to. Uh, you know become eligible to compete in oscars and its rules are very very you know biased it is based on the you know, you know a few people white men who decide what is which film is good and it is totally uh, opaque also not transparent who selects what is not transparent but studies show that it is comprised of almost 95% of white men not even women white men decide thirdly it is all totally euro american centric you have to have a release in us and this there is a kind of you know the, the kind of dominance that hollywood has on the world and in the industry is reflected that is what makes oscar a big thing uh, otherwise i think there have been if, if you look at any any as oscar awards whether it be acting or you know maybe technically right i think technically even technically bafta would be a better award there are better awards you know which looks at technical aspects Whether it be cinematography or you know, sound or whatever, the Oscar is not the no. If you look at you, just take uh, you know uh, films and also 
uh, acting performances as a kind of uh, you know uh, way to check Oscar. You can see brilliant performance outside. Even in Indian films, you can see much greater, complex, nuanced kind of performance. Never figure an Oscar. So why look up at Oscar at all? You don't have to look at Oscar or Khan or whatever because they have their own preferences. All these film festival circuits have very Eurocentric, very white centric anti, you know, very colonial kind of attitude that they have towards third world cinema, towards Asian cinema, towards all other cinemas in the world. And they don't have the time, they don't have the patience, they don't have the intelligence to look at the aesthetics of the East or the other, you know, the piece, the kind of what other films are doing, what kind of concerns that an Indian filmmaker has. Because you always, you look at the pattern in which Indian films have figured in internationally, you know, the film festival. It will was, it was always be about you know, India is an exotic place, an exotic place, a place of violence, poverty, you know, all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, very, uh, 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 a kind of India, they don't, they're not bothered with contemporary India, but whatever, if a film in, deals with contemporary problems of India, urbanization of India, they, they don't figure it out because they think we are their past. So that's totally, don't, uh, you know, uh, uh, consider Oscar as a kind of, you know, any kind of you know, measure about the quality of cinema. Nothing to do with that because Oscar has been a horrible uh, evaluator of quality. Uh, and you know, if you look at the political cinema, you, you just can't mention Oscar at all. So they have always been uh, racial, except for some very brilliant uh, outspoken comments by certain artists on the platform. Otherwise, it has been always been you know, American-centric, very colonial kind of you know, award. So in that context, how do you see uh, uh, International Film Festival of India and the International Film Festival of Kerala? Right. Uh, I think one, yeah, one, uh, uh, actually one challenge, one responsibility of regional film festivals is to actually showcase uh, what is happening here and to bring into conversation our filmmakers, our film culture, our young aspiring filmmakers and film students and film critics or film community with the best of the world cinema. So what you have to do is actually to, to, to pick and choose the best of what is happening in our country, in our languages and showcase it so that it gets national attention. So it is taken out to other festivals. Secondly, you also bring the best of world cinema from what is happening elsewhere to, uh, to us, to, to the new, to the, uh, to a local audience. This is what we should be doing. But often what happens is that if you look at IFF, it is being taken over by industry. It is run by almost by uh, Hindi film industry. You all have this task there. It was nothing to do with the quality of films. And again, the kind of uh, the, the kind of the political uh, uh, dispensation uh, about selection of films, about the juries being appointed. All these have you know, actually uh, in subverted the original the intention of, of showcasing the best of cinema. There's nothing critical about state, critical about uh, powers uh, are figuring that all those filmmakers uh, and you know uh, who are critical of the government are not part, made part of the jury. So there is a kind of uh, kind of you know uh, IFFI film festivals becoming a spokesperson of the state, which is very bad for art or any kind of art institution. IFF in that sense has been a, an exception, in the sense that it has always been very, uh, uh, has always had a kind of very uh, careful choice of films. Uh, it has been able to, despite all the controversies and all that, it has been even, you know, film enthusiasts from other parts of the country would agree to the fact that the choice of films that IFFK has is much more politically sensitive. It has a kind of uh, self about people in the third world, which should look at what is happening. We should give emphasis to third world films. So that is one thing that is very, very important to think of, especially for students here and the kind of you know, film audience here tend to think that if with the internet, everything is available. So what is the, what is the problem? But actually it's not available. What, is, what becomes available is the mainstream cinema, is the most, you know, the films which are made by uh, people who have means to reach out to the world, who can actually, you know, action uh, company who, who actually control film social circuits and, you know, these uh, platforms through which films uh, get transmitted. 
but all these other filmmakers the marginal films the, the counter films that happens in many of the parts of asia latin america africa other countries never get never figure there so i think we need festivals to bring them so that what is you know left outside the mainstream uh, we get a chance to watch that okay sir so uh, usha ma'am is wondering uh, is the indian audience ready for iranian style film yeah uh, i i am not a great fan of iranian cinema but uh, but for certain filmmakers like kerastomi and all that but i think one thing about iranian cinema has been that um, it has been it is a cinema that is made uh, under great restrictions mm -hmm. that is what makes uh, with them very strong like very the, the kind of narratives that they create become so gripping and because of the fact that they can't show a lot of things they can show a woman they can show a man touching a woman so you have a lot of whole lot of you know uh, 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 restrictions censorship huge censorship you, you just get you know killed or you can get imprisoned like uh, our, our friends like majid majid or who all these filmmakers are finding it very difficult to talk there like you just can't make films so what you do is like with the within the given kind of you know restrictions about showing human figures about uh, uh, you know uh, uh, representing some themes there are a lot of limitations so they are trying to make films which will hint that you walk in a very nuanced manner a lot of things that they want to say so they have been if early phase you can see a lot a lot of films based on children you know? they have been if you look at the films of all these great filmmakers you can see they have been focusing on children kerastomi makbul bab or you know majid majidi farhadi all of them they have been made because that is safe to do like you can just uh, look at you know, follow a, a, a child and then talk about the environment and all that so i think uh, and if you look at if you look at contemporary cinema like separation a whole lot of films that come with it is so provocative actually so it is actually a kind of talkies that they are making maybe basically because of this visual limitations of you know uh, of uh, the inability to show a lot of things it is a huge talking film which is a bit boring in the sense like and harping on the same kind of subjects and in its variety except for some filmmakers like rasulov uh, he is a brilliant filmmaker there are certain exceptions otherwise what is you know a celebrated uh, uh, in the in the in the, the popular circuits uh, are you know on the one side they are trying to cater to a particular kind of market that iran cinema has created all over the world and also in film industry circuits secondly many of the radical filmmakers are made silent are silenced by the world which also is a factor we have to see okay so deepa thomas asks uh, how does power politics construct truth in contemporary scenario in visual narratives Oh, I think truth within quotes in any case. Like uh, if you look at uh, contemporary cinema, as I said hinted earlier, like if you look at Tamil cinema or Marathi, uh, as I said Northeast, and also the new Telugu serials in Hindi that are coming up, I think they have been very bold. They have been talking about a lot of themes, uh, a lot of lives, like continents of experience that have never been you know narrated. For instance, if you look at the kind of new wave of uh, Dalit cinemas in uh, Marathi, Nagraj Manjule, Chaitanya Tamhane, and all of them, very interesting, formally, aesthetically complex, and politically relevant, socially, you know, searing kind of narratives that they are making. Likewise, Northeast films in Northeast are doing it. So I think uh, these are, I think, truth statements from below. and also if you, i'm also very you know uh, fascinated or by by this new tele series like apatha lok or you know uh, secret games and all that which looks at the history of indian politics a lot of things that are happening and what is happening what is the source of this violence what is the source of this concentration of power how was this nexus between media caste and political power working in in indian context what are our cities what is city life like the kind of you know uh, uh, the the inhumanity uh, with which it is built upon all these aspects are coming out to series i think which is speaking truth in a sense i don't know how long all this will last but still i think it is very positive kind of 
change. So as a last question, uh, um, I would like to know, um, uh, what is this uh, relationship between uh, film and cultural imaginary? Like, uh, does cultural imaginary shape film or uh, does film shape cultural imaginary? I think it is a kind of, you know, it's a two-way process where you have a lot of, you know, cultural imaginations are formed through cinema. I think. Cinema created a lot of you know, uh, cultural imaginations. As I said about, maybe about heroism, about what is the manly thing to do, what is right, wrong, uh, what is the ideal. And even the, the, the whole uh, lot of films which, in the, especially in the 50s and 60s, which, you know, uh, which are actually narratives about the nation. What what is you know the, the national model modernity? What is Indian modernity? All of these were actually first uh, articulated, imaged, imagined by cinema. You can see a whole lot of films, uh, you know, creating, molding the cultural imagination of India, cultural imaginary. Vice versa, on the, also on the other case, like you can see, what is Ashish Nandi says, you know, even before uh, political activists took up the issue of corruption and, and you know, the other kinds of violence in Indian society, even journalism or you know, politicians took up, cinema actually reflected in the 70s when you have this old, very violent, uh, angry young men emerging who, 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 doesn't be, who, who, who are taking on the system. Who are questioning the system, who are taking arms to you know, correct things. He said this is an indication of cinema actually uh, sensing the pulses of the nation, of the, the what the nation doesn't include, what it excludes, what it sidelines. So I think this is a very complex kind of you know uh, dialogue that is happening between uh, cinema and the cultural imagination. But I think if you look at the last 20, 40 years with the coming of television and the coming of social media. Cinema has actually become much less influential as far as uh, uh, this, the, the popular imagination, national imagination, cultural imagination. So this is becoming actually uh, very, very marginal. Though it has a kind of uh, iconic kind of space in it, but social media is doing a much bigger you know, role in fixing agendas, to push issues, to foreground certain issues. And all that. I think that is much when there is also there is no uh, as you know like cinema works with a different kind of uh, time frame and it doesn't have the kind of immediacy that television brings to life and you know everything it it upsets the pace of everything like it is a kind of uh, incessant everyday judgment you are selling people you are you are selling people to gallows every day the television like it doesn't. Uh, you know, other systems, cinema is like a kind of legal system or other kinds of administrative system, which works at a different kind of pace. It needs to have trials, interrogations, inquiries. It takes a long time. It takes time uh, for a uh, something, a resolution to come about. But television and social media can't wait for it. So it has a different pace, which is actually, actually endangering the, the democratic process of the country. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you all for uh, listening and uh, asking questions. And thank you. See you again. Yeah, thank you.